Okay, now I'm going to introduce you to somebody very special indeed. Somebody who has lived their passion and achieved some quite outstanding things. Come from a very humble background, as, as many of you have, and, and I certainly have, and achieved some wonderful things. That's a great way of connecting with people and sharing his story. So would you give a fantastic round of applause, please, for Neville Wright. Two people speak. I thought I'd get the coat. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic, weren't they? Well, I've got my notes here because I normally ramble on and uh, and lose track of the time. But I've got somebody who's very efficient, and so I've got to be spot on. So, um, good evening everybody, are we all enjoying ourselves? Yes. And um, I've got a question for you, but I'll answer it. Uh, uh, what do you call a writer that gets 48 other writers to write their book for free? <laughs> a genius. A genius. <laughs> Perfect. And before you all go tonight, as I've learned something from this man, and as you get older, you learn more. Before you go tonight, I'm going to sign you my next book. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, most people who do write, write, they would love to write full time. They'd love to write for a, uh, a living, uh, but we have to uh, we have to fit it around our day, day job because uh, really. Um, we can't uh, afford, we, you wouldn't be able to live on the uh, proceeds. Well, I can't, anyway. This is uh, my book, uh, the answer is yes. And um, I couldn't live on this because all the proceeds are given away to uh, Care International. And I'm very proud, and this is something that Mark uh, has uh, hit on earlier this evening. I'm very proud to uh, uh, have helped uh, six, over 16,000 startups all over the world with that book. So uh, um, I'm very proud of that, and I'm sure um, Mark's book will do the same. So uh, we fit it around the day job, and I reckon we do it. We do it for no, no, no money, but we do it because we know other people who are going to read, read the books, will get uh, pleasure, they'll get information, and uh, that's, I think that's what makes us do it. And I'm sure your book will be a, a success um, as people learn a lot, uh, so um, so there we are. And uh, what's behind this this book? Not my book. This book. This is what we're on tonight. What what's behind this book? And it is um, if you dig deep. And I was up to the early hours of the morning because I only got it last night, eleven o'clock. I got my uh, copies, and uh, and I was up most of the night reading about everybody else's. And um, there's forty eight. Uh, life stories in this book. Now, uh, when I got the call in February from Mark, or I got an email, I was halfway through my second book, and I got this email, and I answer all my emails on the day, or I put them in my um, to-do box. So, I answered it, I stopped my book, and I started that day on the chapter for Mark. Because and then I finished it that day and sent it back to him. Because if I hadn't have done, he would have dropped in my to-do box, and nothing gets done in my to-do box. <laughs> <laughs> we all get two of the emails. So uh, I thought a brilliant idea. Get it done. Well, to, tonight, Mark has uh, asked me to do an in-depth life story of my 45 years, and he said he can only give me two hours to do it in. So, but um, looking for you, I've condensed it and it's going to take 10 or 15 minutes. So, and I've, uh, I've only put the frilly bits in, the really good bits, I've took all the horrible bits out. As you can well imagine, there is some horrible bits in uh, 45 years of business. So there's a, a couple of things that uh, I need to tell you 
uh, before we get to the story because it has affected me from birth, it's affected uh, my schooling and it has uh, affected my success uh, and it has been my success in life. And uh, there's two words that have followed me around uh, all my life and that, that is uh, dyslexia and ADHD. And, um, and in the 50, I was born in 1950, so in the 50s and 60s, uh, this wasn't heard of in schools. If, if anybody knew about it, it didn't trickle down into the teacher's mind. So they had two other words for dyslexia <laughs> and, um, and, and ADHD. They didn't know those, but their words were stupid and naughty. So, and they had a cure. In 1950, they had this cure going through to 19, the 1970s that you had a cane and you thrashed the child and then miraculously, it could read. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is, this, I'm going off on a tangent, sorry. Um, okay, okay. Uh, it's 40% of uh, self-made millionaires have either got dyslexia or ADHD or both. And that is brilliant. But what isn't brilliant is that I, I do some work in the, uh, uh, with prisons and what isn't brilliant is that 70% of people in jail have either got dyslexia or ADHD or both. Now there's something dreadfully wrong going on with the schools. And, and you'll, I'll come to that in a, a, a second. And um, I lost my place. <laughs> anyway, um, we'll get started now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew from the first day that I started school, I was in the wrong place. And I was five, and I knew it. I just never got it. Why were we all made to sit still i i never got that and why well whenever ever i looked at a page with writing on why did all the letters jump about like fleas on a on a page and so it started from the first day i didn't know what this game was everybody seemed to know the rules but they wouldn't tell me so I was uh, left a, a bewildered, uh, not understanding how to explain that these letters were jumping about on the page. I just said to the teacher, I, can't, I can't, can't see, I can't see them. So what they did, they sent me to the uh, school doctor. They gave me uh, a pair of uh, national health glasses. I was only kidding the school in 1955 to have these. And they changed my name. They stopped calling me Neville, and they called me Specky Eyes, Four Eyes, Goggle Box. So, this is the this is children. This is what children do. But you know that was just great because um, that it starts to affect people. It does. So I still couldn't see when I put my glasses on. The letters jumped about. They were just bigger. <laughs> so, so they broke my desk next to the teachers and I was about this far away from the blackboard and that was great for the other kids because they could throw things at me so when the teacher wasn't looking so all these things go to making uh, what, you, what you are when you're at school and the teacher I remember first thing she pointed at the words in my book on a line and she pointed to them and she read them out. And then she said, now you do that. Well, it's quite easy. Because I, could, I pointed where she was pointing and I repeated what she re told me. And she said, that's good, now carry on. Well, I couldn't. It was impossible. But she took couldn't as wouldn't. And she grabbed me, she put me in the corner of the classroom and smacked my legs and said I was being naughty. So 
When I went home and my parents said, what did you do today? I said, the teacher put me in the corner, slapped my legs and told me I was naughty. And they said, well, you must have deserved it because the teacher wouldn't have done it. No. Remember, this is 1955. It's not today when you realise your children shouldn't be uh, abused like that. Anyway, so I carried on um, being naughty and, uh, and stupid and uh, getting punished. And when the teacher punishes you, it gives a green light to any bullies in the class that they can do the same. So this was my schooling. And I changed school at 11 and um, I did my 11 plus. I didn't do it, rather, because there was, uh, I didn't know what it said. I didn't know what the <coughs> questions were. Uh, and um, I couldn't shout out, will you come and help me? Because you're not allowed to speak. So therefore, I didn't pass anything. I didn't even fill it in. So it just got worse. And between the ages of 11 and 14, I just wanted to die. And, um, and you hear about kids nowadays with social media who, who do dreadful things. Well, I'll tell you a few things what I did. But um, if there was social media then, I could have learned how to do some real damage to keep me off school forever. But if I could have read, I wouldn't have been in that state in the first place. So, um, you know, there's, so I used to bite my arms uh, and tell my mother the dog had bitten me. She didn't believe me. I used to say, I sprained my ankle and I can't walk and I could put a good show on and uh, she did, didn't believe me. Uh, I've fallen out of a tree. I hit my head. And, and maybe one day a week it worked. But then she said, never again. Every week she said, never again. Because at five past nine, I was fit, fit as a fiddle. And it was like, I was free. And um, anyway, so what school did teach me uh, was to think quick to duck and to run when I was getting beaten. So uh, that's what, and, and one of the best things they taught me to get out to get out of it was to be a truant. So they were the things, uh, apart from three other things, uh, which I'll tell you, um, they were the things I learned at school. And each year, they used to put on my report, apparently, because I couldn't read it, Neville could do better well, I don't, when they wrote it, to me, that reflected on the teacher. Didn't, you know, Neville could do better. What about the teachers? Could they not do any better? But the three things I did learn and I did take away from school was survival of the fittest, understanding how to play chess and, and all the things that go along with chess and life and the times table and I use, I use those every day. So advice to my younger self is it's not always possible for other people such as teachers to see what you see. I used to look at the clouds they say well look at the blackboard. Well clouds were more interesting, give me ideas. And um, so Please, I would say to myself, please tell your parents and please tell your teachers that you're not being naughty. It's just something that you can't help and, and it's not naughtiness. Uh, you need a different curriculum, not one that they think fits all, but you need a different curriculum for different people. Um, I couldn't play football through my dyslexia, so, but they never punished me for not learning that but they punished me for not learning to write. But they, they did make me, uh, and, and the, the, uh, w there was a team of us who had a four-wheel cart, and we used to pick up the stones. So we kept the playing fields good for people who could play. 
But at prize giving day, there was prizes for the best footballer and the whatever, best cricketer, but there was never a prize for the people who picked up the stones. And, uh, and, and going on to my building sites, you know, I was, there's no rubbish, there's no, you know, everything is nice, clean and tidy. And uh, I got it from that, picking up stones. So I did learn a few things. And, um, and when people say they want to die, I would tell my younger self, just get through one hour at a time. And imagine you really can have everything in life that you want, just as uh, <coughs> said before, Zig Ziglar, one of my um, mentors. And, um, and then, and just start writing your goals down and imagine you are going to get these goals. So that's what I tell my young self. So after leaving school, am I talking fast enough? Um, almost. All right, okay. After leaving school, <laughs> um, I, I, I um, got a job and I went into a job, uh, after job, after job. Um, they could see I was organized. I could organize people. I had that ability and they used to promote me. And as soon as they promoted me, there's paperwork. As soon as they knew I couldn't do the paperwork, then the trouble started and I would run. And in the 60s and 70s, you could run in the afternoon from a job the next morning and get a job just like that. And uh, that, was, that was it. But my life changed on the 25th of June, 1966 when three girls come to my house. It was a Saturday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> I was 16. <laughs> um, so two of the girls I knew, and one I didn't. And she was shy and didn't say anything. And, um, and she was very, very, you know, I liked what well, I liked. I liked her. And, um, <laughs> and, and unbeknown to me, these two girls had brought this other girl to have a look. <laughs> to have a look at me. So a couple of weeks later I met her and we became inseparable. And um, that girl had come to have a look. So we was inseparable and um, we got married actually. And it was uh, 4th of July, Independence Day. Uh, 4th of July 1970 we got married, started the family in 1971. And in those days, boys called girls birds. <laughs> and she was my bird, uh, she was. And throughout uh, the years, I thought this bird will fly away. And she could have for lots and lots of reasons. And, and especially when they're going up to. And this bird never flew away. And this bird's here tonight. <laughs> years wow. yeah so anyway my um, tipping point in life uh, came when I was uh, 24 um, when we were we were um, married we were broke uh, we was in debt we was living in a 10-foot caravan uh, with our three-year-old daughter and I thought things could couldn't get any worse and you shouldn't ever think that because <laughs> I got fired from my 17th job. And um, that was 1974. And it was just a uh, started three day week in 1974. Only electricity in factories for three days a week. Uh, the, um, the economy was going down and, um, and I was out of a job. And it's the first time in my life I couldn't go and get another job the next day, so I was on welfare, and um, and at school they said, right, you won't amount to anything in life. You're one of the life's losers. You are, and that's that's what happened. So, and if you're told that for ten years, and it goes in your brain it will stay in there and you'll believe it. And I'd had 17 jobs and, and I was living in a caravan and it was like, it's true. They told me the truth. I never amount to anything. And um, I was on the dole for three months 
And on, in those days, <coughs> you were, as far as being concerned, um, there'd never been unemployment like it was, but you were scum. And that's how people treated you. I felt like I was scum, I was a beggar, the lowest of the low, with no hope of getting a job, because there was millions unemployed, and out of those millions, most of them, I would imagine, can read or write. But I was 24, and I couldn't read or write. And so what chance had I got? But when the pain becomes so great, and you can't stand to see yourself begging anymore, that's when you have to change. Now, one of the things that I, um, I was inspired by was when I was a four-year-old, my father used to tell me he should have, and that's the uh, title of the uh, chapter, I should have, I could have, I would have. Um, I got it back to front, by the way, um, I, I'll put it the wrong way around, but that's what dyslexics do. Um, so, uh, so I didn't realise that till last night. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah and, and, and my dad always said, I should have gone into business when the war was over. He'd got a, a, a job waiting for him at the power plant in Peterborough, but he was a carpenter, a skilled cabinet maker and a French polisher. And uh, this guy with this uh, shop uh, selling furniture asked him to go and be a partner. He could have been a partner for nothing. And he said, I should have gone with Dobson's and we would have had this and this and this. And if he told me that story once, he told me the full story 10,000 times. Now here I was on the dole with that ringing in my ears. My dad reprimanded himself every single day of his life. And was I going to do the same? That was ringing in my ears. So the tipping point, it was when I was begging for another two pounds a week to feed the family, and this lad behind the counter in the Dole office said, if you want more money, and he's looking at my file, he says, you have one child? Yes. If you want more money, have another child, and then you'll get more benefit. And they still say that today, they do. <laughs> and um, I knew then and there, I wasn't that stupid. <clears throat> And I told him where he could put his doll money. A bit hot-headed because I didn't get anything for that week. I shot myself in the foot. And I cried on the way home. I did, thinking I'd let Marilyn down. So, um, that day was the 26th of September, 1974. In the afternoon, when I come home from the doll, I invested 37 pence on a piece of scrim. This is a cloth for cleaning windows. And on the Friday, the 27th, I went out and started to clean windows. Now, the answer is yes. Now, what is the question? That came from a customer. And it was about two weeks later, and I was up the ladder cleaning her windows, and she came out of the house, she looked up at me, and she said, Neville, while you're here, can you? And I said, yes, I will. And she said, I have not asked the question yet. <laughs> and I said, no, I will do anything that you want. And in my mind, I was always saying, as long as it's not immoral or illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married. <laughs> so uh, my mother had always said to me, right from when I was a baby, uh, to like, forever, if you do anything wrong, Lord Jesus will punish you. It will punish you. Well, I've you know, had enough punishment already. I didn't want anybody else to punish me. <laughs> so I would do anything. And that's, and, and that's where the uh, title come from, my autobiography. You know? um, so I realised that I wasn't in, I haven't got a window cleaning business. And it clicked, dawned on me. I've got a property maintenance business. With a window cleaning business, you've got a ceiling on how much you can earn. With a property maintenance business, there is no ceiling. So this property maintenance business, in my head, and, and, and then it started to grow with a positive thoughts, which you was on about uh, earlier, uh, started to grow, and within three years, we was employing six people. I could employ them, I couldn't pay them, Marilyn could do the bookwork, so it's a good combination. 
and she was out on the uh, building sites every day mixing concrete and putting tiles on roofs and all kinds of stuff and uh, and then after three years the business was big enough uh, to expand now what would you expect a building business to expand into a second hand cram nursery shop <laughs> why why did we do it <coughs> marilyn wanted an office for the building business what was going on and then she said well there's some room we've got a terraced house there was four rooms in it oh it's loads of rooms i desk and do a bit of paperwork i'll sell some crumbs and we knew everything about the nursery industry because we bought a second hand cramp for our daughter, a second hand cot, and a second hand high chair. What was there to know about? <laughs> so, anyway, um, people started to come in, and within three months, we were selling all new products. People were coming in, and they heard about this little shop, and we got to a point of it, it filling up, and people queuing outside. And I remember one day a guy came in, because I used to work on the building site in the week and in the shop on a Saturday and it's heaven I, I didn't go home dirty I didn't go home full of brick dust and muck and stuff anyway so uh, this guy came in and he said oh you're busy today now aren't you and I go I looked at the floor and go, no not busy no and he goes what are you looking at the floor for I said because I can see carpet if we're busy I can only see shoes and that's the truth of the matter. We could only see shoes when we were busy. And I decided that would be it. Every shop we had, you could only see shoes. So um, uh, we had to get out of that shop because uh, we'd been there three years. It was too small for us. But instead of moving location and just shutting it down, we sold it as a going concern. I never realised there's some money in selling businesses. And I only got that information from an estate agent when I went to see him. I said, I want to close the shop. And he said, why don't you sell it? Which we did. And we went into a bigger shop, five times the size, and we did it again. We built a business and sold it. And another one, and another one. Anyway, I'm cutting a lot out now, because now <laughs> we are, I did that over 30 years, or, you know, 20 odd years. So, um, over, over that time, we'll get to 2006. So, the property maintenance business had grown. And we were in property investment business, and now we've got 30 million pounds worth of property. So, and in that year, we was building the sixth, uh, what was Kitty Camp, in the sixth location in that year. And uh, we had grown to be the biggest independent in the UK. And um, although in 2006, we hadn't, we'd got about 80 staff, but we built that up over the next few years to so 120 full-time staff in one shop. And I borrowed, uh, well, we borrowed, it's not just me, we borrowed uh, 12 million to build that building. Uh, just the shell, really, not the inside, but the shell. And, um, and we were going to pay that back over four years out of profits. And this was what, was what we knew the profits were for the last few years and, and going forward, and it's a tremendous shock. Um, and that's what we were going to do. But we didn't. Um, think that it was going to be a recession <coughs> and by um, 2008 uh, it was in full swing and we were losing £250,000 a month. Uh, we had sold everything we could sell or remortgage, everything we could remortgage and um, accept our home. And then it got to breaking point and the only thing was left was the, and it was like a mansion that we owned, and we'd lived there for 26 years. And I went to Marilyn, and I said, um, I think we have to sell your house. Because I always used to call it Marilyn's house. And I wasn't going to take any responsibility anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, she looked at me with tears in her eyes, and just walked away. 
two, two weeks later, we was taking our suitcases with some clothes out of that house. We left everything in for the purchasers and we left uh, and we walked into our offices and we lived in our office for two and a half years um, to and I, and I said to her you know it's not only saving the business it's saving 125 jobs and 125 families so uh, that's it so two and a half years we lived in there and in the meantime our property portfolio dropped in value from 30 million to 20 and in the uh, government's uh, wisdom on uh, April the 1st 2008 it was a shocking day they decided to put rates on empty commercial properties and, and we had got a lot in that um, uh, property portfolio and people were uh, uh, dropping out and was going bankrupt and uh, that year we ended up with a million pounds less revenue, less rents, and a million pounds more rates. And this was when we was losing 250,000 a month in the shop. <coughs> so things wasn't good. And, and I'm only telling you the best now. <laughs> so, um, I got down here, to say the least, it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> And it was, it was. Um, 2000, uh, we came out of 2008 in the depths of despair, mentally and physically. And it was like the same as uh, all those years ago in 1974. The same feeling was there, but in 1974 we hadn't got 125 families or 120 families to feed. And now we was only 14 million. The banks tried to pull it in, take it away from us, but we said we'd see them in court because we'd never missed a payment. And they backed off. And, uh, but they didn't back off with a lot of people uh, who lost their businesses. And uh, mentally, it was, um, it was bad. Because all those years that we'd worked, and uh, for 38 years, we had fought every day to build those two incredible businesses, burning our bridges every single day, telling ourselves that we would never go cap in hand, begging for assistance ever again. And um, I, would, I would tell myself every single day that those people who told me I was stupid, I would prove in my mind that I wasn't stupid every single day that I was building those businesses. These were the things that drove us on. But in the recession, doubt started to, uh, to come in. And we had to make some drastic alterations to the business model. And it took six months to, to uh, design and build and uh, bring in our own products. And within a few months, there was 39% of our turnover and growing fast. And those were with much bigger margins and we could ring, uh, run rings around the competition because it wasn't a like-for-like -like product. It got a different name on it, basically. The profits started to come in. Sales were increasing every week and we started to thrive again. Uh, the uh, tenants were trickling back and we were letting property once more. And as you can probably imagine, the recession had taken its toll on us. The laughter every day that we'd had for 38 years had all but stopped. As over the last two years, there'd been too much day left at the, uh, left at the end of the money, which was uh, frightening. Every, I used to see the accountant, our, our in-house accountant, every single day as the money ran out but the bills were coming in for the afternoon. And it's £9,000 cost to turn the key in the door every morning. So it was, there was a, a, a dreadful situation. Anyway, we was coming out of it 
and we've built the, the um, business, we've built the new building uh, to take us up to 200 million pounds turnover. <coughs> and um, we was doing 40 million pounds, it was climbing. But did we, did we want to uh, take it up to that next level? Had we got the, uh, had we got the energy and um, the majority of the high street was still in turmoil with the businesses going bust virtually every day, great businesses, and most were searching for acquisitions to uh, bolster their own business. And as I saw it, we had two choices to get it up to 200 million. Uh, we'd got to hunt for another large nursery business, which was, um, they were there on the high street, three of them, and um, were, we, were we going to be doing the same as the others? Well, as normal, um, throughout our lives, when everybody is zigged, we have zagged. And, it's, um, and we've never followed the crowd. We've been disruptors in, the, in, in any business we've been in. And, um, and we decided to be the hunted. And at that time, I got a phone call from an agent who said, I've got somebody who wants to buy your business. And I said, we have a business to sell. And uh, because all businesses go round in circles. <coughs> Just one line. So we decided that we'd put it on the market. So in late 2010, we put it on the market and within days, we had 30 offers from the high streets, from, from people in the high street. Seven of them were really serious uh, with 70 million pounds in various forms. But on the 29th of January, 2011, I accepted an offer for 70 million in cash which landed in our bank account on the 14th of February, which was uh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a world record for an independent um, mum and dad baby nursery shop. Um, so that's been our story cut down quite a bit. And I'm now, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank Mark for uh, creating uh, the, the book, um, Advice to your young self. I should know. I should know. Advice to your younger self, and um, and say I hope. Uh, I thank you very much, Mark, and thanks for inviting me here. And, and I hope you have uh, enjoyed um, uh, listening to me share my story tonight. Thank you.